Evolutionists regularly claim that starlight from galaxies billions of years away are proof of an old Earth. After all, if light travels at a constant speed, and a light year is the distance light travels in one year, it only makes sense that it took billions of years to get here. Creationists, however, can grant the evolutionists that the galaxies we see are actually billions of light years away, and that the speed of light is constant. But evolutionists forget that Albert Einstein proved that although the speed of light is constant, Time is not. It flows slower in a gravitational field, and Earth, being in a galaxy somewhere near the center of the universe, is at the center of the universe's largest gravity well, where time passes extremely slowly and at one point stood virtually still. This is the only explanation for why all the galaxies in the universe appear to be flying directly away from us in concentric shells. It's why the universal background radiation is the same, no matter what direction we look in the universe. It's also why even the farthest galaxies we see in the universe are fully formed. It's taken almost a century, but Einstein's theories are finally showing the scientific validity of creationism. So why do these scientists just ignore this proof? I had to investigate. In 1907, Albert Einstein introduced the world to his theory of special relativity, essentially reimagining our view on the nature of reality. In Einstein's model, space itself is warped by the mass of an object, causing the trajectories of anything passing by that object to be inclined toward it. Much like a heavy weight on a trampoline, massive objects distort the space around them. This was proposed as the mechanism behind the force we know as gravity. Einstein's calculations based on this idea yielded far more accurate predictions than even Newton's laws of motion. While this was already an innovative idea, Einstein went even further to propose that time, as an additional dimension in our reality that we call space-time, is also affected by the gravity of a massive object, essentially predicting that time slows down in higher gravity. While this explains the erratic orbit of Mercury and has been confirmed by the use of atomic clocks in aircraft, the application of this prediction is particularly important in satellite communication. As you watch this episode, at least one satellite is compensating for this time differential just to bring you this video. In 1994, Russell Humphreys published Starlight and Time and took Einstein's ideas in a new direction. Using the Bible as his guide, Humphreys' scenario begins with the universe as a white hole composed of a gigantic mass of water. Being such a massive body, this mass of water distorted space and time enough to where everything deep within it actually experienced an extremely slow flow of time, specifically Earth. On the second day, when God separated the waters above from the waters below, he created a vast expanse between them, which Humphreys calls the firmament, or the heavens. As this expanse continued outward, Earth, our solar system, and presumably the entire Milky Way galaxy were temporarily within a distortion, still experiencing time at an extremely slow pace, while the outskirts of the universe experienced time much faster. On the fourth day, when God created all of the lights in the sky, such as stars and galaxies, their mass pushed our galaxy and most of the expanse below the threshold, no longer experiencing time. Once it had all been created, God then stretched out the entire canvas of the heavens as mentioned in Job, Isaiah, Psalms, and Zechariah. Zechariah. This led to all of the galaxies slowly raising above the no time limit incrementally from the outside of our universe inward. Because of time dilation, millions or even billions of years had passed throughout the universe, but only four days had passed in the gravitational well on Earth. Humphreys claims that this is why we see distant starlight from billions of light years away on an Earth that is only around 6,000 years old. This is the scenario that Humphreys presents and claims is 100% consistent with Einstein's theories of relativity. However, there are some discrepancies from the very beginning. Like a black hole, at the center of a white hole is a singularity, where matter and energy is so compressed that it no longer has any definable dimensions. The only difference is the directional flow of time. Time flows in the direction we call forward toward a black hole, while it flows backward from a white hole. If there were a large mass of water, which Humphreys predicts to have been two light years across, it would gravitationally collapse into a singularity and cease to be water. It would cease to be hydrogen or oxygen. It would even cease to be protons, neutrons, or electrons. This would require the first miracle in Humphrey's scenario to be new physics to prevent this collapse into subatomic particles. There are further complications due to his calculation of this initial state being a black or white hole two light years across. 
Without going into the mathematics, considering that the mass of the observable universe is 1.5 times 10 to the 53rd kilograms, using the Schwarzschild metric derived from Einstein's field equations, we should actually expect a white hole within an event horizon of 4.7 billion light years across. This is not only larger than our entire galaxy, or our local group of galaxies, or the entire Virgo supercluster our local group is in, or the Pisces Cetus supercluster which the Virgo supercluster is in, or even the proposed Laniakea supercluster which the Pisces Cetus is theorized to be within. In addition to this, according to Humphrey's model, we should actually see events such as supernovae occurring millions of times faster in the most distant galaxies we can observe. In fact, this should only take roughly 17 seconds in the furthest galaxies we see. What we actually see is that there is in fact a time dilation due to these galactic velocities, but it appears to show that time flows slower in these further galaxies. For example, supernova eruptions take six weeks to go from normal to maximum light, then six and a half months to fade. In the furthest galaxies, supernovas brighten and fade about 25% slower, taking up to nine weeks to brighten and even longer than nine months to fade. Also in Humphrey's scenario, light from that distance should be blue shifted since its frequency would be faster and its wavelength should be shortening as 13.7 billion years worth of light arrive in only 6,000 years. As I've covered in several episodes, in 1929, Edwin Hubble formulated Hubble's Law based on observation that in fact, the further away a galaxy is, the more it is red shifted. In Humphrey's model, light from the furthest galaxies should be blue shifted over 833 billion times, far past the gamma range, which would raise Earth's temperature by thousands of kelvins. So direct observation shows that Humphrey's model is fundamentally flawed. The initial problem is that Humphrey's calculation for gravitational time dilation is far greater than Einstein's equations predict. Humphrey's also abuses the trampoline model, which is merely an allegory to illustrate how mass affects the space around it. It is not meant as a literal model. Another argument Humphrey supporters state is that the universal background radiation is the same no matter what direction we look in the universe. While it certainly does persist in every direction, maps of this radiation demonstrate conclusively that it is anything but uniform in intensity. Throughout history, various creation models have consistently attempted to put Earth at the center of the universe. Galileo Galilei was even placed under house arrest for opposing the church's assumption that Earth was the center of the solar system. Humphrey's model continues this tradition by proclaiming our galaxy is the center of our universe. He asserts that the rest of the galaxies in our universe exist in concentric shells of uniform distances from our own. As we have mapped the universe as far as we can observe, it has become obvious that there are no concentric shells of any sort. We see a randomness which would follow if the universe had expanded from the random, cacophonous volume of the Planck length, where the laws of physics, as we understand them, break down. As far as we can see, the space between galaxies is expanding uniformly in every direction from every location. No matter where you are in the universe, the rest of it appears to be expanding away from you. In the end, as numerous physicists have pointed out, when removing Humphrey's miscalculations, even if the origin of the universe were a white hole, we would not recognize any difference in the universe. We would essentially be left with the Big Bang model, even in that case. So Humphrey's model is merely an unnecessary just-so story with no application whatsoever. It has led to exactly zero new discoveries in science, but after discovering these flaws, it is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.